So let me move on. I will be back with you in the audience, but let me move on from here by introducing to you our panelists. Uh, we have a panel and we will um, talk to them as well. So the first one I would like to introduce, he has studied both econometrics and economics. He has worked as a, he has a long career in science at the University of Tilburg. His research is in the field of both law and economics, uh, where they meet, regulation of markets, and he's now the chief economist of the Dutch Competition Authority. Authority. Please have an applause for Paul de Bell. <laughs> Paul, if you will take the chair on the left. And then uh, she has worked as a policy advisor for, amongst others, the Social Economic Council, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Social Affairs. She's now member of parliament for the Green Left. Please have an applause for Senna Matouch. Senna. <laughs> Senna, if you take the oh, chair, yeah, we, we'll do girl boy, girl boy. <laughs> then you've met him already. He's the deputy director of the CPB, the Netherlands Bureau for economic policy analysis. He's a professor of economic growth and development, and he has a lot of expertise in international trade and global change, value chains. Again, an applause, please, for Marcel Timmer. <laughs> now, thank you all so much for being with us here. You've all followed in the past. Yeah, we would like to fill up the first front seat, of course. Um, you have all uh, followed the Rethinking Economics debate. Uh, you've read the book. Um, and there are some topics you would like to discuss today uh, after hearing Diane's input and reading the book. Let me start with Paul. Paul, um, what do you feel like uh, economists or policy economists can and should do better? Um, first of all, just looking at what's going on in the outside world. And, and coming back to the issue of competition policy, so I'm not saying that the economic theory, the I.O. literature, industrial organization models and so on should be abandoned, so not at all. But I think the starting point should always be to understand what companies are doing, so what types of business models are they using. And to understand that, you should really talk to people in companies, look at what's happening, rather than starting with a model with a profit function that a firm is trying to maximize. It doesn't really make sense as a starting point. It may make sense as sort of an analytical tool, but you want to start with what's happening in the world. And, and looking at the literature and economics, so I think there's too little case studies. Like you, you see many of them in the management literature, but hardly any in the economics literature because it's about big data sets if it's empirical. But just a qualitative descriptive case study can we provide so many insights. So just as an example of where I think economists can do better in, as a way of coming up with more practical and in that sense more effective policy recommendations. Okay, so case studies, talking to the outside world without bringing in your model and your theories maybe at first? Yeah, maybe as a way of classification, understanding what types of situations may occur, just as a starting point. But not as a checking the boxes kind uh, of... No, uh, not, not, not <laughs> as sort of the, 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 the mold in which you are trying to frame everything okay. into. Then yeah. at the end you have to, you want your advice to be implemented and there's politicians, there's... Uh, how about that? How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's an, another interesting point. Uh, so I often say in, in, in discussions I have with people that so in, in Dutch, I would say economy is politiek. So, so in, in English, it would mean economics is politics. That's sort of the rough translation, or maybe economics should be uh, political economy. But what I'm trying to say is that you can figure out in theory or based with data what an efficient allocation is. But if you don't take, take into account the political constraints and the division of power among people who can influence the allocation, then the um, analysis falls short of being relevant. And you can say as economists, well, that's up to politicians, for others to decide upon. But I think then you really miss the chance of making your economic analysis relevant. So I think it should be part of the economic analysis because it's part of the way things work in reality. Okay. So you should take the political constraints into your analysis. Yeah, and understand how power is being used, leveraged, and so on. So okay. have an understanding of the powers at play, because otherwise the analysis is extremely partial. Okay, 
Thank you so much. I'm going to ask all of the panelists their points of view, and then I'm going to ask Diane to respond to that. So let me go on to uh, Senna. Senna, in the book, Diane makes a plea for learning more from other disciplines. We have a few tiny bits in the room. Sociologist, there's one yes. sociologist, and maybe, and then there's the business economist, which is also an economist. Um, what, what do you think about that? Oh, there's so much to say, and I've been I've been in politics just a bit more than a year, and one of the things that happens is you start talking a lot. So cut me off when I'm uh, start <laughs> blah blahing. So that's a disclaimer. And the second thing before I start is I fully agree with descriptives, observing without, uh, and sometimes I think, especially in the academic literature, just describing what you're seeing, how valuable that is, and maybe you should get into a journal when you <laughs> write those kind of papers. Um, so one of the things that, especially also in the talk, but also in the book, Dan, is, and I, I think you said it at the end of the lovely interview, by the way, uh, is uh, the influence you have, the, the economic discipline has. And, um, and if you look in the Netherlands, I think we have a very special field where throughout time we see that economic policy advisors and policy makers ec from the economic discipline have a, a big influence. And with that influence comes power. Uh, would you say they're dominant? I think, uh, yeah, I would say they were, they dominant and their dominance has increased and I think now we're having a conversation about it. So the fact that we're having this open conversation here, I think is very important. Uh, and I know from a lot of people, also in policy making, from different disciplines, that can look very jealous at e e economists. They go like, why, why do politicians always listen to them? <laughs> and I think one of the reasons is because uh, the economic discipline has always wanted to improve the real world, has always tried to put their thinking into material actions and create options. Like engineers. Like engineers, or maybe plumbers. <laughs> but one of the big questions you then ask yourself is where are you plumbing towards? Uh, what is the goal? What are the options you lay on the table? Because you can plumb in different directions. Where, where does the water have to go? And I don't know how far I'm going to put this metaphor, but <laughs> I think you get it. Uh, uh, and especially in the, in the policy-making sphere, where you're not only looking at dynamics, but you're also, well, inherently I think economics is normative, because every welfare function starts with the utility of, of, of that welfare function. And that's, th th so especially when you're translating into concrete options, translating into how you're going to shape society, you're mixing normativity with whatever objectivity. And I think in that sphere, for a long time, uh, we've, we've very limited our sets of, of thinking, and we had not one uh, diverse influence of, of different kind of uh, thinking, both from other fields, but also within economics. And my main message would be that those that have the responsibility of thinking of what the options are, have a very big responsibility in opening the set, uh, 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 not only in terms of options, but al also in terms of norm normative positions. And being blind of that normativity, uh, uh, which is perfectly described in the book as mm -hmm. well, I think is a huge limitation in doing your work, your work so well. So that kind of sounds like uh, you said there should be more competition from other disciplines. Does it mean you want sociologists to think about labor markets? Well, they do, of course, but um, or even uh, markets, um, economy. But yeah, wh 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 what do you mean? Where, yeah. where, what should I mean? We can think yeah. of them, but but do you feel like the CPB next time they're gonna give an advice about uh, even the election programs? that there should also be an advice from sociologists and maybe environmentalists? Well, well we start so to do what that do I already. Mean? I think that's a good <laughs> question. So, in general, I think yes. So, more competition of ideas with different streams. One of the things I really like right now is the, the fact that we have people from different planning bureaus here, that we have cooperation between our planning bureaus. But even within the economics discipline, I'll never forget the period where we would have the labor, mar the, the labor effect model. Uh, and you would look at, for, for the Dutchies in, in, in here, the ISK, and out of the model would get cert certain labor market effects. In that same period, I would read a behavioral study from the CPB that showed that individual parents did not know they were getting that tax instrument. So in no, no way you could have that behavioral effect that you were finding in that model. 
So when I'm talking about comp competitive ideas is what are your assumptions of the behavior you're seeing, what are the assumptions? The same goes for, for example, m macro models. Uh, are you going to, and, and I know this is a huge conversation in the literature, and you have different streams, but are you going to look, uh, are you going to base your models on a stock flow? Or, and I always forget the, the, the English word, an Evigs model, um, an equilibrium model. Um, when you choose one model, you're making a choice. So when I'm, when I'm talking about competition, it can also mean that you're saying there are different ways of looking at this, taking these different ways, these are different effects you see. And one of the big steps I'm seeing right now, specifically in the policy field, that we're seeing that more and more in advice, that we're saying, if this, is, if this goal is something you find important, then this is the thing you should go to. Uh, but we're finding it very hard in the technical sphere to allow that kind of competition within the economic field, to put models next to each other and show the effects next to each other, and then also maybe even allow more competition of ideas uh, okay. in the bigger sphere. Okay. I hope that's an answer. It is a, a, a beginning of an idea of what we can do, I think, yes. Um, before going to Marshall makes it more difficult because I can imagine that you want to respond to that. Uh, you, you, were, you were moving yep. on. You want to first respond or because I also want to ask you to, do, to tell us a little bit about uh, the advice you asked from philosophers actually on this subject. It's, it's up to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah now it's easy to combine actually. Um, so. so when we actually started to think about this idea at the CPB, uh, we started to dig into history, like has this discussion taking place at the CPB earlier? Well, I just heard, and we <laughs> afterwards we need to have a drink uh, to tell me the story. But what, I, what we found actually was that in 2016, there was a report of two philosophers who actually assessed uh, uh, one particular publication of the CPB exactly from this perspective. Uh, and they made an interesting observation, um, and that is that they make the distinction between normativity and neutrality. And Diane also used this term, uh, neutrality. They claim everybody has norms, uh, and every researcher has norms. There's, n there's nothing wrong by being normative. Um, and I think that Diane also makes the plea that we should actually be explicit about our norms, uh, so the aim is not to be non-normative, but to be explicit about norms, and then, the very important step, to, tr to try towards neutrality. Now, what does that mean? Neutrality means, and I think that that's what you're pointing at, neutrality actually means that you make sure that there are, op are different options on the table. Uh, and wh what I, do I mean? Well, these options can be at different parts of your research. So wh when you start your research, you start with a research question. Well, why is it exactly this research question and not another research question? You have to ask yourself. Then you're going to use data. Well, data is not neutral, right? Data is being constructed always. Uh, are you actually aware of how it's being constructed? Are there biases in the data? Are there alternative data sources? Then you're going to use a model, right? If you do good empirical research, you want to have it theory driven. Well, what kind of theory are you using? Uh, what are the underlying assumptions? Are there alternative uh, assumptions? Do you get different hypotheses? And then you have your results. But also, the way you present your results um, makes a big difference how you do that, actually. And are you pointing towards one finding, or do you uh, present a range of findings? So I think that that's, that's your plea, right? To, to have at all each stage of your research showing different alternatives. But then, I encounter two dilemmas, which I also want, want, want to pose to the other panel members. One is where to stop, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it is yeah, a serious yeah, question, yeah, right? Really so, yeah. uh, and you might want to say, as economists, as economists, we know where to stop, actually. And you might want to say, well, we stopped too early, but at least there is a coherent framework which we can easily apply and quickly apply, and everybody understands. And this is why we are actually so Im impactful, uh, because we limit ourselves in doing so. Uh, there's this famous story about sociologists that each sociologist has her or his own theory, which makes communication very hard between <laughs> sociologists and with the outside world. Economists have, have it, uh, do it differently, but makes them more efficient, right? So the, the, As the, a group. The, there's a trade-off there, I think. Um, and the second one is, are policy makers actually happy with us presenting a whole set of alternatives? And this, I'm not that clear. I thought in the beginning, okay, that this is what you need to do to be neutral, present all the alternatives. But then policymakers are perhaps not that happy if they are offered with 15 different solutions. I think Truman 
was already unhappy about the two-handed economist, if we yeah. give him 15 yeah. dollars. <laughs> um, the Diane, list. there's a lot on the table. Can you pick one or two things to start with you want to respond to? There is a lot. Um, so, and I, I agree with a lot of what my fellow panelists have said. Uh, one of the times when I learned more about economics than ev any other time was my ye uh, years on the Competition Commission, when we did go to visit companies and um, talk to people. And that's how you understand how businesses operate. You, you can't, you know, it, it's not the way that the models work. The models don't reflect the way that people operate in businesses at all. And there was a fantastic occasion when we went to visit the site of a software company and they made the mistake of letting their salesman talk to us. And he said, he said oh yeah, um, the company that's trying to take us over, we never go to the areas where they, where they operate. So they'd carved up the geography between them. And that was case closed, really. We would never have learned that from an economic model. So that sort of shoe leather economics, yeah. talking to people, finding out how things work is really important. And I'd link it to the point about interdisciplinarity. We need the other disciplines. I, I couldn't do a lot of my work without working with engineers and computer scientists, but, but sociologists as well. And I think sociologists actually have left too much to economists. Um, they should have been looking at financial markets in the early 2000s, and one or two famously were, but not many. Or during the pandemic, when we finally got the economists and the epidemiologists to talk to each other, but actually to understand why vaccine take-up was different in different groups, maybe a sociologist in that mix would have been useful. So different disciplines, uh, different methods, and econ economists are very focused on you download the data and you run some fancy econometrics on it. And actually there's a, a lot of um, opportunity to create new data by walking around, by surveys, by using text with new techniques and so on. Um, Marcel's dilemmas are, like all dilemmas, really hard, and maybe other people in the audience want to have a go at um, answering them. Um, and I think, actually, the first dilemma, where do we stop, and isn't it good that we have more or less the same theory that we're operating from, I think that's not true anymore. I think in s so many areas of economics now, people are operating from different theories. And the whole debate about is neoclassical economics defunct, neo just linking it to neoliberalism and so on, in monetary policy and competition policy. So I'm not sure that's true anymore. And of course, policymakers absolutely don't want alternatives. They, they want to be told for sure what they ought to do to get the result they want. Um, but at least what we could do is say, if you want this result, then the policy that you're proposing is not going to deliver that. So point out inconsistencies. And so there are domains, or you know, if you raise this tax rate, this is quite likely what will happen to the demand. There are, there are those kinds of territory um, where, where you don't need to give alternatives. But there's this comment or joke that's often made, um, you know, an economist says, this is the right thing to do. I've analyzed the situation. This will solve the pension sustainability crisis if only the politicians would implement it. <laughs> but if it's not implementable, you've not done the analysis properly. So um, we, have to, we have to grapple with that. Okay. That last part is, I think, what Paul was saying. If it's not impl implementable, then you haven't done the analysis correctly. I think we yeah. have a couple... Yeah, you want to add yeah, something? I once, yeah? heard, I once heard an economist say about the climate crisis, we have already solved the problem long, a long time ago. <laughs> And it's yeah. just now CO3, up to politicians CO2 to implement it. And, uh, and I, was, yeah. I was stupefied by this <laughs> remark. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, I think we have a couple of very important questions on the table. Where do you stop? Um, uh, how, to get, yeah, how to really act with those politicians? They want an answer, but you can't always get it. You offered a solution. You said, well, at least tell them if they decide on doing something, what can happen. Um, and I think there was also another question that Marcel mentioned when we were discussing this, is, and that's the question, what will it bring us? What will it bring economists? So um, let's see if we can get these answered. Um, or, well, if you want to add some new ones, of course, you're free as well. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm looking around the audience. I, I promised to pass by with you again, so here I am. If you can stand up, then uh, we can, people at home can see you as well. Yeah, I, I had one clarifying uh, question. What do you mean by normativity? Uh, there are various ways. There are biases, conscious or unconscious biases. That would be one thing. Another thing could be uh, interests. Uh, people are paid by, by, 
by a ministry or paid by an environmental uh, um, uh, environmental organization or whatever. And thirdly, what you uh, your political view and political view, including, for example, if people care about poverty or care care about climate change, yeah, that totally impacts, uh, that totally takes away your objectivity. So what do you mean exactly by normativity? I mean um, this idea of um, better. S so economics, we're max we talk about maximizing utility. That's inherently about um, economic welfare. So that's right at the fundamental of the subject. But for me, the motivating question is, I, I'm co-director of a public policy institute. I've spent a lot of my life doing public service economics. What is it that I am trying to achieve with that? What is it that it means to make things better? And who's, for whom? Is, is my version of better the same as other people's version of better? Uh, are there distributional effects that I should be worried about? So it's really that sense of economic welfare. And... It's not since the 1970s that economists have thought seriously about economic welfare. There are a number of classic texts published in the late 70s. And there's been a bit of a vacuum ever since. Okay. Audience? Yeah, I'm looking around. I will get back to you, but I also want to give the other people a chance. Well, you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, so, come on. Yeah. Do I have to stand up? Again? Yeah, yeah. If you want to speak, you stand up. Yeah. Uh, a number of years ago, not so long time ago, one of the predecessors of Peter... Uh, wrote a paper on shareholderism and the basic assumption that he, together with, it was he, so now you know who it's not, the author, uh, together with a Tilburg professor was that a fundamental assumption in the analysis, and that's why I'm asking this question, is that the firm is owned by the shareholders. Now, if you depart from that or leave from that point of view, you get a totally different approach, for example, also in the competition authority, to what firms do or should do uh, in com comparison to the situation which has been brought forward by legal scholars uh, increasingly. Perhaps you know Margaret Blair in that, uh, that sense, that the firm is not owned by the shareholders. The shareholders merely own a share. Exactly. And the firm is owned by a bunch of other people, in particular uh, the employees. Now, if we introduce that assumption, we get a different assumption. And my, question, my basic question is, why don't we compare these basic assumptions in the analysis? So the assumption that we make is, has something to do with rational behavior or not, or uh, psychologically deviant behavior. But it goes even further, I would say. It goes back to our most fundamental concepts in economics, like who owns the firm. And then, again, again, keep saying, <laughs> what's the question? So this, that's a statement. What's the question? The question was, why don't, uh, you know, is, the, is the, uh, the difference of opinion that we have, doesn't that go much beyond the technical assumptions that we use in our models? And it's a more basic assumption, okay. like the so one that I use maybe in my too example. It's easy to just think that it's just a matter of the assumption. Who would like to respond? I, I heard you also. I can say something yeah, about yeah. It. I felt you were going to say something. Yep. No, <laughs> one of the, so I was hesi hesitating when, I was, when you ask, uh, are you an economist or not? Because I, 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 I believe that only if you have, have a PhD, you're an economist. But the most fun conversation about economics I have with my younger sisters and young cousins. Uh, average nine years old, oh, uh, okay. and then you get questions like, what is money? Yeah. And you're like, well, <laughs> I got a master's degree, I'll tell you. Uh, it turns out it's really hard to answer those very basic questions. And specifically this question you're asking, what is the firm? Who owns the firm? Um, and we've had, if you look at the literature, and I think some people might have read uh, Rutger Klaas's piece in ASB about if you go back to the legal entity of what a firm is, and what we as a society asked what a firm was, for example, in the UK, we asked a public purpose before we legally acknowledged the firm. And it had to be in the statue uh, of origin. We used to have that in the Netherlands as well. Those conversations about what economic entities are, what they're driven by, and how both in your, your legal fr framework and then how you translate that in your assumptions about behavior and in your economic thinking, to a long time, 
when I was talking to my cousin of nine years old, I had those conversations. And I believe, and I don't know how, uh, how often you think about these kind of questions, maybe raise of hands, like when's the last time did you have this conversation this month, maybe? Anyone? A conversation like what is money yeah. or what is a firm, like these, uh, there's one philosopher, I'm sure he did. There's a couple of hands here. What, what, what was your question you were thinking about? I don't about? have a question, but I have a son who is 10, so uh, I try yeah. to explain what type of work I do, and that's quite hard indeed. And so does, it, does it affect the way you work and the way you think about your work when you um. have these discussions with your children? Yeah, at least when I try to explain to them what type of work I do, uh, it, it helps me to, um, to explain why it's relevant, the, the work I do. Yeah, but it doesn't so affect the way you do your work. Uh, no, I don't oh, think right. so. Okay. Good. Maybe I thought that's an easy one. We sh you sh should all start talking to our kids. And <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there was another hand. No? Can, I, can I just say a word yeah? about... Yep. Yeah, first respond and then I'll go to the, this gentleman. Uh, my yeah. husband has me on video uh, say, talking to our then five-year-old, being unable to explain to him what economics is. Uh, I think we're making the same mistake with data. Things become part of the mental furniture. And we now have this model where data is property that's legally owned. And we tick a consent box online and it becomes the property of the firm. There are different ways of thinking about data, and a sociologist, for example, would have a completely different framework for thinking about data as an expression of social relations which isn't ownable by, by anybody. Um, so I think that's a really good caution. Yeah, how, but how can we get this out of the intellectual way of thinking about it and make it practical and really like use it um, in the way we work? I, um, did you have a suggestion or did you have a question? It can be both. If you if you don't mind, can you stand up, please? Yeah. yeah. What's your name? Um, my name is Robert. I'm an intern at uh, CPB. I had a very general question, which isn't directly related to the discussion from like two minutes ago. That's OK. We but have a new subject. Uh, sure. <laughs> and like in a panel discussion, there was this very interesting point where people were saying, like, we have these traditional areas where economists are always you know, doing stuff, competition policy, labor market policy. And of course, it would be great if economists would accept like, more help from other disciplines, sociology, psychology, political sciences, mm -hmm. philosophy. I was also wondering, we see these areas which have not been traditionally dominated by economists, like areas of crime or conflict studies, where we see where economists are actually trying to contribute. Do you think it's helpful for economists to be involved in that in the first place? And do you think there are like, general tips for economists who are trying to okay. see if they can add value to like, those kind of disciplines which have not been traditionally roamed by economists in the first place. Great question. Very fun question. Who would like to respond? Oh, I'm sorry. Marcel, yeah? Maybe if I can give a, what I think is a good example. Um, when you study, for example, the impact of a tax and on, say, meat, if you want to reduce meat consumption for whatever reason, right? Maybe because of stick stuff, you don't know. Um, what happens when you raise taxes on meat? I mean, the economists would, would say, okay, Let's look at the elasticity of substitution, price elasticity, that's it. Um, a social psychologist would say, well, meat consumption, hmm, this is really, th there's a tradition around meat consumption. You actually should study the traditions around meat eating, and if you want to have an impact on that, you should actually, the drivers of that culture around meat is something which you should actually affect. And that would be a a uh, sociologist who would say, well, eating meat also means, say, a particular status, particular way of life. So if you want to reduce meat consumption, focus on that particular merits from meat, right? So you have three different perspectives on how to bring down meat consumption, and, and raising taxes is just one and might actually be uh, uh, not the best option. So in that sense, I think the, uh, it's complementary. You, you, can, you can use different insights from, from different disciplines, actually, to look at one particular question. So the, that's a success story, I think. Um, but you also have, say, examples where it doesn't work quite that way. So, and this is the difference between multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity, right? Multidis the example I gave would be multidisciplinarity. You look at the same question from different perspectives. Interdisciplinarity would mean you actually integrate them. Uh, and there gets the hard part. Uh, and that's also what we, I think, experience as economists when we, when we talk to sociologists or psychologists, just by language. Uh, I won't bore you with the details, but I mean, if we engage with other bureaus, 
getting the language right is already is is already hard, uh, and is a hill, is a fixed cost. <laughs> you have to invest in order to talk to people. You might say that's a problem of uh, of education, right? Uh, that's what Diane, I think, would argue that economist actually needs to be the economist education needs to be not just in the one single economist language, but also have the other concepts from psychology and sociology in the first year. Uh, and I think that would definitely that will benefit the economists for better understanding. You are doing that as a CPB. You are working more and more with the uh, uh, Environmental Planning Bureau and all that. How do the methods um, mix? Is, is the language very difficult? Will, will it, where will it bring us 10 years from now? Yeah, well, uh, Five? We, we tried, so for example, the uh, people in the room who know the Kantreich series, where we actually uh, uh, try to work together with people from uh, uh, the PBL and the SCP, and those volumes have been quite successful, at least from our, from the economist perspective. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? Well, th that's the interesting thing. So, so if you talk to the people who cooperated from the non-economists, they would say, well, we were drawn into the ec economic paradigm of it. Uh, and actually, we did, uh, we did not have that much influence on exactly what methods were being used. Uh, we, we got an additional column, say, in the... <laughs> uh, so, but, but that, what, then what did it bring you? I'm not sure. Um, well, it, it definitely br brought us, I think, uh, that there are multiple criteria uh, uh, which you need to use when you are assessing a particular policy advice. Um, and I think what we try to do also, and what we will continue to do, is, is to bring in those different dimensions. Question is, how, how do you do it? Do, do you do that by bringing in sociologists, psychologists into the CPB? Well, we can talk about that. Or do you try to cooperate? But then you have to invest. It, it, it's not like, it's not a very efficient process of doing that. So are, are we willing to pay the cost in order to to have these benefits. I think it's a crucial question for us. Okay. Um, Paul? Yeah, coming back to the question <laughs> about applying economic analysis to crime, for example. We all know, most of us know the work by Gary Becker, who got a Nobel Prize for this. I'm a bit critical about this, so applying a model of incentives to, to try to understand how crime works uh, or how a family works and so on. I think we should be a bit modest as economists, not trying to understand everything in terms of incentives, because there's much more. There's values, there's meaning, there's connection between people. If you try to understand all these things in terms of uh, incentives, then you sort of, sort of miss, completely miss the point. And the analysis not only sort of miss, misses relevance, but also gets a bit weird, I think, because you sort of miss the essence of a situation. But so is incentives all you have to bring? I think, no, I think um, endogeneity, general equilibrium, is actually a really important concept. There was a um, table doing the rounds on Twitter yesterday showing deaths uh, from different uh, causes, and the tweet was, um, there are many, many more deaths caused by the legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco, than all illegal drugs put together. And this was viral. And nobody who was retweeting this had thought to ask, well, if the illegal drugs were legal, wouldn't the <laughs> amount of consumption have changed? And so it might be further up the table in, in that case. So th there's more than just incentives that, that, that we can bring. So the, the framework of kind of meta tools of economics is really powerful. Okay. Okay. Um, what will it bring economists if we do this? If, and, and, and when I say if we do this, I'm not sure what I mean, if we do what. But I think we kind of get the idea, don't we? Um, but what will it bring them? I mean, they're dominant. They're the, you, you ask them to work with other bureaus and the other ones will just adopt to their program and get an extra column or to their model. So what will it bring them? They will probably just fall off their pedestal. I think there's somebody behind you who's about to answer that question. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it will bring you? What's uh, your name? Yeah, Please. I'm Egbert Jongen. Uh, yeah, we're... Um, I also admit I'm an economist. <laughs> you like admit? Economics Anonymous here. <laughs> but, um, and I'm also responsible for the silly model for the, uh, uh -huh. for the ICK, sim ICK simulations. But, the um, silly model for the ICK yeah, yeah. simulations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. We should talk a bit more about that. I was thinking, I liked, uh, so I liked what Marshall said first, like, uh, so where do we stop? But also like at what he said later, like where I would say like the question for CBB is more like where do we start? <laughs> 
So, and then my question is, so where do we get the biggest gain in bringing in these outside views? I think the idea of like seeing how things actually work in real life is a very nice idea, but the other would be like to bring in the thoughts of other disciplines at the, all, all the way at the start. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, so we had the, uh, I don't know, visitation committee, it's a bit, sounds a little bit positive, like evaluation committee at CPB. <laughs> I think most of them were trained economists, right? So. So again, we'll probably get feedback on, like, from an economics perspective, but I think it would be interesting to also have other disciplines in, the, in that grouping. And it's the same if, so last year we had a nice exercise where we, all the programs at CPB had to write a paper about what they think are important themes for the future. Mm -hmm. And we thought we did a nice job, so we talked all to great, clever people. <laughs> but actually, like, listening to all these people, yeah, they're all economists, you know, so it's like... Uh, okay, but then yeah. what are you hoping for? I mean, you say it would be interesting. What, what does it yeah, mean? So what it will it bring you? Yeah, so what it will only bring us, I guess, is that we'll get, kind of get state-of-the-art questions and analyses and methods from the economics discipline. But we'll probably miss maybe some of the bigger no, questions. No, I get that. that. Okay, but sorry. if you if you take so it's always economists doing all this stuff, and you're mm. kind of saying, well, bring in other people, bring yeah. in the <laughs> other ones. And I know I have some experience, right, working with people from and the social cultural will bring office. That? Yeah, what so will I thought. It bring you? I think it brought us like uh, looking at different outcome measures, which would be an additional table in the mm. column, indeed. <laughs> yeah. But also like thinking about different mechanisms that are at play. Yeah. Indeed, like the role of information and. Uh, so uh, when did that happen? When did something like that get you? Yeah, this is a, it's a gradual started. process, I would say. But I would okay. say, so we're trying to do that. So that's also why I stood up and yeah. it didn't is sit down immediately. Yeah, a new way of thinking. Indeed, because I think, so when uh, Diane started, she was talking a lot about redistribution. I think like, okay, so we got discovered. Kind yeah. of like, <laughs> that's what we think at CPB. Yeah. At least we spend more uh, effort on that. But, uh, but I think there's other things that we still have to invest in. Okay. And so the question is, where, where do we have the biggest gain? So maybe it is all the way at the start, right? Where, mm -hmm. when we, what are the topics that we want to research? Maybe that's where we should okay. look at it. So I was thinking about what you think about Where that. should we start? Yeah, where yeah. should we start? Where should we start? Anybody? And otherwise, here as well, where should we start? Yeah, and maybe to say yep. something, to answer that question, you also have to ask the question, am I afraid to lose something, right? Because we were talking about, and I think Diane said it very good in, in, in the talk at the start of this, is the role of experts and, and the field we're talking in. And it's the joke you made about economists, we, we already solved the climate problem. Yeah. Uh, all they have to do is listen. Uh, so th the context in which you're advising, the context in which you're doing research, and the context in which you're offering options is one of more polarization, is one of less trust in institutions. Um, so when you're having this conversation, like we're having right now, you're also being very vulnerable. Um, and, and I think one of the things you said in putting the two dilemmas is maybe we're, we were so influential because we had focus. Uh, so when you're, you're asking yourself, what, should I what am I going to change? Also be honest about what you're afraid to lose, what you think you're doing, and why you think you're having impact with that. What do you think they are afraid to lose? Um, I, I don't know. Not just them, but we... No, but I wouldn't know. I think it's, I'm asking the question because I don't know. What is the, the, the group of policy economists afraid to lose? Well, st status and influence. Status and influence. There's influence. a government chief economist. There's no government chief sociologist. Yeah, you don't have to be an country. economist to realize that that's a very... Negative yeah. incentive. They won't yeah. do anything then. Yeah, and uh, you know, economists are, uh, like to have a very tight job market for economists and get paid high salaries. So it's not going to happen then? Maybe not. I mean, it depends. If your motive is getting a high salary, you'll be against it. If your motive is fixing problems, you might be more in favour. And there are many examples of uh, better problem fixing when you bring in other disciplines. A uh, well-known example um, on our side of the channel is the Ebola epidemic when the Department for Health was very involved in the international effort and the epidemic was accelerating until they brought in the anthropologists who knew about uh, burial customs in West Africa because burial turned out to be one of the main vectors of transmission. Yeah. So that helped the so world, helped but the it world. didn't help the economists. No, but that's why it's about so maybe motives. Okay. That's well, I, I would like to briefly go back to Paul because you mentioned competition policy and obviously, well, we have to talk to Paul about it. And you, you, you said in your speech, you said, we should, shouldn't we take nationality into account of the companies? Um, I, I would still like to hear a response to that from Paul. Yeah, I think it matters a lot if you think about, for example, ownership of a company. So if we have a, have a company here in the Netherlands taking care of energy or water or something, do we want to have a foreign shareholder? And on top of that, a foreign shareholder who is very far away 
geographically lo located from our country. And would you consider that an economic question? Uh, yes, but a bit more than that. It's also a geopolitical question because an, a foreign shareholder may have different mm -hmm. motives than just making profits in the Netherlands. So it may have motives like obtaining, expanding geopolitical power, which is problematic for an economist to understand because I don't think we have many models or not the, the standard models that can, can include this. Uh, and there's, then there's also the question of to what extent will such a shareholder take into account the public interests of the local citizens here? Will it take that into account? And, and if, it, if the shareholder doesn't do that automatically, can regulation and legislation save us from that? I think it cannot, all, well, not always at least, because you cannot write a complete contract, so to say, with legislation that takes into account all risks and, and eventualities that may happen. Okay, so the questions do come up, Diane, but is this what you mean by how you should take it into account in competition f um, policy or...? Well, the models, the nationality of the company doesn't feature in the models. No, so we, we do ask the questions, but we can't fit them into the models. The regulation is also different. Yeah, but difficult. coming back to my, the practice of, of the competition authority, so we may also at some point come to the conclusion that a certain takeover poses no problems according if you just to the according to the competition models, which is a fine mm -hmm. conclusion in itself. But then we should perhaps point out to policymakers and politicians, well, look out, this is our conclusion, but our understanding is that you take, should take, take into account a broader picture about this issue that really presents itself. And be really explicit about that. Yeah, exactly. It's that, that okay. maybe a, a challenge for us to, to, to actively uh, communicate about that. Okay. How? How can we be more neutral and transparent about all the values that we have. This is more about um, warning at the end, like, okay, this is what we have from our model, but also think about the other stuff. But how can we be more open, neutral about the hidden values and normativity that's in, in the models? Anybody? Is that a matter of communication? Is it talking to our children? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Sir. Oh, my name is Bert Kramer. I also work for CPB. Yeah. Uh, I would say the first step is uh, introspection and discussion among ourselves yeah. to know where these, uh, you know, these hidden assumptions are. Yeah. But how does but, that work? Uh, well, I think being here today is a good start, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think you need to do that first before you can think about how to communicate this to the public or to policymakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But do you remember a time or a moment when you realized, oh, wait? I've been, I've always been taking this for granted or thinking that way and I was never aware that you could also think differently or something as an economist. You, all of you must have had a day of a kind of realizing like, oh my God, I'm an economist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm, a, I'm an economic historian, so I did stand up when you asked uh, who is an economist, but uh, okay. I pretend to be a bit of a hybrid. Uh, yeah, you're sense. a weird yeah. guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, yeah. Uh, I don't no, have a ready answer to that, sorry. Okay, yeah. okay. I remember walking around in the Ministry of Finance and realizing, oh my God, it's really only about if it costs any money. Nothing else <laughs> here. Um, anybody else? Yeah, here. So, so, I mean, this is not just a starting point. I'm hoping to see that their introspection is working. What did you just realize? Oh, well, um, I actually wanted to slightly no, change your question. Is that okay? No, or but first, really, what, what are your hidden <laughs> values and normativity? As an economist, what, what's your field of expertise? What do you work on? So, on like actually on measuring well-being. So at least like mm. it's uh, it, it goes a little bit beyond like uh, I guess the common economic yeah. indicators that we tend to focus on. You are so, already broadening up. Uh, yeah, although I think I think it's also like it is really difficult though, right? To actually open up. I guess I guess given like a kind of like an, a certain type of tools that we have already and that mm -hmm. we have developed. But also, I guess, like one of the reasons that we have developed such tools is also that those are uh, aspects also that are, that are a bit easier to measure. Yeah. So yeah. I yeah. Think, uh, okay. So that's one thing that you yeah. always end up with the stuff that you can measure. 
I think it's... You have uh, to be aware of that. That is, I think, something. I, okay. Definitely, definitely. Your question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, actually, I guess my question is also, is a little bit more on, like, where our res responsibility stops uh, in f for, like, taking this hidden normativity and economic policy advice into consideration. And that's um, related to a particular practice, which I think is quite rare, or even, like, unique at the CPB, which is that we actually make predictions or projections of what the effects on certain economic variables are of uh, party manifestos. And we present that to the public. Uh, that's quite. Um, I think it's unique. I'm quite curious whether whether this is actually something that we should do, or do we actually like just take way too much space pretending neutrality and providing neutral yeah. information to uh, to to well to citizens. Let's see if Diane knows about this practice. Do you know what the CPB? Yeah. Okay. And that there has been some um, discussion, at least in small circles, of whether we should. Um, do the same in the UK. We have an independent think tank called the Institute for Fiscal Studies that does quite a lot of that. Um, and an inquiry by the then government chief economist into whether there should be an official body that did that said, um, no, it doesn't matter because the IFS does a good enough, does a good enough job. So we, ha we have something similar. But I think the main responsibility is stopping it being hidden and just being a little bit more explicit. And particularly in these areas where for both politicians and the public, they see economists having you know, stand-up rows with each other. This is how you do it. No, this, no, it isn't. This is how it works. And in those areas, surfacing the um, different sets of value judgments is the first and main responsibility. Okay. And who are you? Please stand up. Yep. Uh, my name is uh, Francis Weisig, and I'm also working at CPB in Netherlands. I think we have a private uh, course here for CPB uh, person, don't we? Um, <laughs> Now, explaining what you're doing and what you're not doing, explaining your assumptions. Um, I think actually the, the challenge there is uh, getting them across. Uh, because even in a study like uh, the analysis of the Dutch uh, party election programs, um, we dedicate a whole chapter mm -hmm. to explaining the methodology, to explaining all the caveats and a lot of footnotes, uh, explaining all the behavioral uh, responses that we could not take into account in our models. Um, but that doesn't mean that the chapter gets very well read. <laughs> but uh, are you suggesting that the chapter is, um, that everything is in there? All the normativity and the values and the axioms? I think there's way more in there than people realize. And m m what I'm struggling here is, uh, struggling with here is, we could add more, but how do we make sure that the limitations that we already try to point out actually are taken to okay. account. It's like Marshall's question, where should From we stop? Yeah. 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 Diane? Uh, I'm supposing you have all the oh, answers, but gosh. of course you don't. No, 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 these are hard questions. And actually, I was just thinking I would reformulate Marcel's dilemma. Um, because if you listen to people coming from different perspectives and disciplines, you understand that concepts are, are um, uh, multiple, that there are different... Um, dimensions to a sense of value. It's not just the economic dimension to it. But then politicians have to make yes or no decisions. So somehow you've got to collapse all that down. Yeah. So this is inherently very difficult. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think I've got the answer to the question, I'm afraid. Oh, except, maybe except that it's not just about communicating that way, it's also about listening. But that's okay. the important thing, right? I mean, that's... It, it, it has to be two ways, right? Uh, we can explain even better what we do, but if you still notice that the other side doesn't take notice of that, you're doing something wrong, still, of wrong, or it, it can be better, I guess. Uh, and, and that's the danger if, if we are doing things and explaining them, uh, and after a while we get bored explaining them again, again, and again, actually, and especially if you do it for 10 years, you say, ah, oh, we already, five years ago, we already explained exactly how, how that was. But we need to challenge ourselves, ev not every day, perhaps, Every, every, every <laughs> Week. weekend, uh, you need to uh, invite people to challenge you, right? Uh, and you have the duty to, to explain it again and again. Oh, and that, that might be tiresome, but it's part of And maybe part take of it of out job. of the footnotes as well. You're doing that. Yeah, okay. Senna? Is it okay if I say something about yeah, this? Yeah, sure. Everyone, maybe everyone knows I'm from the Green Left, who links, and we have a huge discussion in our party. So I'm not, this is not a formal stand, but is you, should you participate, yes or no? What is it? And participate in what? In the, in the, in the, uh, the calculation of the manifesto, the doorrekening, okay. um, yeah. um, the question that was asked. Yeah. 
And uh, one of the reasons we have this huge discussion is because we, have, we, we look at models and we don't disagree with them, but we find it very important to show that we have plans and, and we find it important. So one of the things we've been doing is what is the goal actually of this exercise? What are we gaining from it? One of the things I think we're gaining is we're one of the few countries in which political parties explicitly not only have long-term goals, but are forced to think about what are the steps I'm taking. One of the things that go wrong is that we make them holy, almost, and then there, there have been periods, uh, I'm very fond of labor markets, that you could tune on the couple of thousand jobs and that would be the decision-making structure on the political table. I've never met someone that said, that's a great idea, that's how we should do it, but still everyone's behaving that way. The question then is, whose responsibility is it? Is it your responsibility in the way you're portraying? Is it the responsibility of putting the footnote up? Is it the responsibility of adding an extra column? What is the responsibility of, uh, of, of those making the program, those making decisions? And how is that interplay? <coughs> and one of the things I believe is that we're living now, and everyone thinks their own time is very complex, uh, in complex times with big transitional uh, ch choices and decisions, in which both the direction and the short-term steps are very important. Um, and one of the conversations we've been having is, uh, we, we for a long time said we should not participate, but we kept on participating. And one of the things we are very happy with that we've seen changed indicators in the door reckoning. So for example, on inequality, uh, um, I don't know who's making the graphs nowadays and the infographics, but we are loving them as well. <laughs> uh, sometimes there's a lot of information in one page. Um, but in that conversation, I believe one of the things we're missing is also a public feedback loop towards politicians and those making decisions stop using our information in that way. Because uh, if you're talking about responsibility, you are responsible bearing very explicit about what you're doing. I said earlier, responsibility on what the model you're using, uh, but you're not responsible for the decision-making table. Uh, and sometimes I believe that maybe we should be more, more explicit in the feedback loop towards those making decisions. I think he, you are doing those uh, calculations, aren't you? No? Somebody's hinting me in my ear that he's the guy. Okay, then it's, I've got the wrong one, uh, Koen. <laughs> um, I've got a question here. Yeah, uh, my name is Joop. Uh, I'm an economics student, but also a student of uh, philosophy of law. So um, what I was wondering, and it's touching upon this, is that there's a certain coerciveness of economic analysis on, on politicians that um, it sort of encroaches on the, the, the level of democratic uh, 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 conversation that, that is to be had in the House of Representatives. So if you have a perfect cost-benefit analysis, for instance, then you almost have no choice to make but to yes or no that. Um, what's as a politician. As a politician. What's your view on that, especially as a member of the House of Representatives? Hmm. Hmm. I, I cannot <laughs> dodge this one, can I? <laughs> I'm sorry? You I cannot said I pass. cannot dodge this one. Oh. Well, in a sense, it's also the question of responsibility, right? So earlier I said, be very explicit. So one of the things I find, and I'm like, I'm a new politician, talk to me in like another year and see what I'm going to say <laughs> then, um, is that in the fields where you have a policy option, a problem and then a policy option that only has benefits for everyone, often we take those. When, when is making political choices hard is when you have, your, your, you have different outcomes and you have to weigh those. Um, and I think it's, it's the politician's choice in representing, in saying, this effect I find more important than this loss, and being explicit at that. Because uh, that's, that's why politics is so tough. Multidimensional, different consequences, with winner losers uh, and different goals. At the end, there's never like a model that's, that's gonna have that outcome. And if we have those, those are the easiest, right? Because those are the decisions we already made. Um, what we can do better, so yesterday we had a big debate uh, about the four nota, so the running budget year. And I was, I was sitting there and was listening. Uh, uh, the CPB uh, study was also an important part of that debate. And looking back and zooming out, at the end of the day, the discussion we're having, everyone agrees there's going to be a welfare limitation. The question is, how do you redistribute that one? Very, very political question. Uh, and if you talk about responsibility and roles, uh, if you look at the debate we're having, maybe 60% was about technicalities, options, whether, the, whether you could do those options, and very little about we agree about that in making that political choice, this should be it. So sometimes I believe, and maybe next year I'll 
been forgotten about this and delete this from the YouTube video or whatever. Um, <laughs> as politicians, we should also be very explicit about that part of our role and not pretend uh, there are only silver bullets. Okay. Peter Haaskamp has a question or a remark. Yeah, following up on, on this, and I'm also, this is also a question to Diane, but the question which pops up in my mind is whether we should more often refuse to give an answer as, as economists, and especially as the CPB. Because, you know, well, our analysis is always incomplete. We know that, and, and we point out that, uh, yeah. uh, where it's in, incomplete. We, it's all, always uncertain. We also know that. But sometimes we also know it's biased because the only thing, we can only calculate an answer because we have to, we apply certain assumptions. Yep. And we know that the assumptions are... You kind of know beforehand what uh, they, they give a bias in one direction or another. And, and of course, we point out uh, that as well yep. in, in, for example, our analysis of the election programs. But still then, the, yep. uh, the headline in the newspaper or uh, in the debate in parliament is about the actual quantitative outcome or, or whatever. So maybe sometimes yeah. we should just say, say well, no. we just, just say no, we should, it's, okay, Correct. this is something where we cannot provide the answer, do it yourself. I think it's a, th this is a great question because if we cannot answer, well, we, if it's difficult to answer what is it exactly that we should do, then we can answer what it is that we should not do anymore. So Diane, maybe you can give a I, I have a lot of sympathy with that. I mean, the inclination is to say, uh, we'll make these 27 different assumptions, and on those assumptions, this is the answer, this is the outcome of this um, particular investment on GDP growth in, in this region. And um, the answer might be, we can't answer that because it depends what choices you make. And uh, the outcome ent entirely depends on your value judgments and your political decisions, and actually, no, there's no technical answer to this, so go away and you know, there's no silver bullet, so bite it, or whatever the Grow metaphor would be. Grow up and do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there any, anything else? You were talking from your role as a politician, so what should you not do? Stop asking the CPB <laughs> doing things, no. Uh, uh, so so I, uh, this conversation challenged me, be more explicit about yeah. the way you're waking, weighing decisions. And I'm still in my head with the dilemmas that you mm. put on the table. Yeah. Because uh, is there a point, where, where do we stop? Uh, and it kind of links back also to that uh, conversation because one of the things, and this is very small, very personal, but once you spread yourself so thin and you do so many things, uh, there's also an end to it just in terms of means and uh, yeah. human capital. Okay. Um, uh, and what I would say, we should, we should listen more to the limitations. I hope I do that and I hope we do that. And the second one is, listen when that's because I just said give the feedback more explicitly uh, and there were not there were no journalists in the room right was there maybe on the stream they never stand up <laughs> <laughs> no because because under all of this and this is also what Diane said in the role of experts the field the, the context in which we're making decisions from every role whether it's from science from a public institute yep. civil servants of politics I think it's a very complex setting okay let's try to round up and um, I think, um, I hope that we can make it a tiny bit concrete because it is so hard to grab it. Uh, we can read the book, we all feel it. Uh, and but we, even the tiniest things that we have learned today. I th like talk to your children because it forces you to reflect on yourself. Like think about when you can say no um, and maybe even give an answer to that. Who dares to be concrete? Who says, well, I think we should at least do this or that, or should not do this or that? I'm looking first here. Yeah, I will definitely give you guys <laughs> a round. Is there anything you guys will do different from now on after this conversation? Yeah. What's your name? Uh, I'm Meiring, also CPB, and I was triggered by more case studies. Because More case studies. Case studies. Well, we love doing quantitative analysis, lots of data, our model, a theory. Yeah. But first, maybe to understand <coughs> what is happening and that you can do Go with the out, case study. find the yeah. story or the, the case study. Yeah. Okay, great. And then maybe start with your data More and case models. Study. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody? I mean, you came here. What are you taking home? What are you thinking about so perhaps this is more of a confession than uh, something i will do differently but so uh, one of my jobs is to be one of the authors of the forecasts 
It's where we write every uh, half year about uh, how the economy is doing. Mm -hmm. And I use many adjectives which have either a positive or a negative connotation, right? So you write the economy is doing well, or this part is doing not so well. Uh, and it, I do have uh, moments where I have a kind of a, what was a conflict well again? of, uh, <laughs> yeah. So am I sure this is a good thing or, you know, are there more sides to this than just one positive adjective? Or maybe next time in the next forecast, you will do an essay on what is well. I don't think I get a word count for that. <laughs> 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 Anybody else? Tiniest suggestion. What, what would you like others in the room to start doing that maybe you are already doing? <laughs> or stop doing. doing. Or stop doing. Yeah, let's stick to that. Yeah. What's your name? Uh, my name is Thijs and I work for ESB. But mm -hmm. um, one concrete thing... A journalist, well, we can discuss about well, it. <laughs> uh, one concrete thing we can maybe do is when we organize a, a seminar and discuss the research we do, we fill the room with other economists. We can also organize... But should we uh, stop doing that? Or? No, <laughs> economists can join in, of course, but yeah. it will be valuable to also present economic research to a room of people from other yeah, uh, leave out the economists every now and then and just see what happens. Yeah, see what, uh, what surprises them about our research. And, 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 and listen to their ideas. questions. Thank and you the so other way around as well. I economists joining yeah. anthropologists. A great suggestion. Seminar. Yeah, that's, uh, and that's very doable as well. Anybody else? Advice for all the others in the room to stop doing or do more. Yeah? What's your name? Uh, my name is Ta Hendrik. I uh, work at the uh, Centraal Plan Bureau. And you should look that way. No, okay. it's just well, that we are not before it. Um, well, we had, um, uh, uh, Marcel mentioned already a report. Um, we, we also discussed in um, like um, a session in preparation uh, to, uh, to this event mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Rutger Klaasens and uh, Ingrid Robijns about yeah, normativity and positivity. Yeah. I thought this was very, um, very insightful. But one of the things I took home from that was... Um, uh, very simple, S stop pretending like you can separate normativity from yeah. positivity uh, and say that you are doing that. Um, and yeah. then I th also think I mentioned it then. What I took from that is that we, in CBB, we tend to have like the little sentences you always put into the publication, like we, the this and this, and then the welfare goes such and such, and then, uh, yeah, there's also this decision. You can make a bullshit bingo around. But that that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the... Uh, that's, that part is a normative decision, or that is up to the politicians. That's, yeah, it yeah. can be a, a bit of be a, sta a standard. Be more careful with those sentences. Well, you put them in like, okay, so now, then you feel, at least I feel like, yeah, now we I'm really a proper cpb or now. Yeah, we took care yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then that, that, that meeting uh, made okay. me realize that, that you don't. So you're gonna and be more careful with these sentences. And at reflect. least I am. Okay, great, good idea. Okay, um, of course, Paul, you wanted to uh, respond. Yeah, I wanted to, to elaborate a bit on what I said before because yeah. it relates to my work at, at the Competition Authority. And in your book, you devote quite some uh, attention to the digital economy, understanding digital competition. And, and this is a field where I think it's very important to start with the business model because I think the way that these companies compete is not so much by lowering prices or, or expanding outputs, quantities, and so on, or by, by just simply investing in whatever they would invest in. But it's by inventing new business models. And these new business models challenge existing market boundaries. So thinking in terms of the relevant market has become much less... They challenge the models as well. Uh, yeah, they challenge the models. They challenge the, the, the traditional framework of doing competition policy. Yep. Um, so markets are in a state of constant flux. Market boundaries expand. New markets are being created by the new business models. And if you start from that perspective, well, that immediately gives you a different understanding of the nature of competition. And only after that, you may still want to end up with some type of market definition and the model of price competition or something like that. But only afterwards, if you think it, it's appropriate within a certain setting and within certain constraints for a relatively short period of time. You may yeah. still want to work with that, but you have to start by looking at what's happening. Okay. Diane, is there some last words that, or, or maybe even tell them what to do from starting tomorrow? I think we've got some great suggestions already. Um, the message I've taken away from this is um, the need to have a, um, a different kind of conversation among ourselves as economists, but also with um, the public and, and the policy makers. Yeah. yeah, well, we've heard that a lot. Any last words from Marcel? 
Well, one of my dilemmas was where to end. Uh, the other one is where to start. But I, I think we are making a start in a sense at the CPB. I mean, uh, we do say no sometimes. So, for example, at the uh, National Growth Fund, NGF, yeah. we were asked to, uh, uh, to calculate to sign off. GDP <laughs> effects uh, 40 years later from financing now artificial intelligence. We just said, no, we can't do that. Uh, and actually, that it was a, it was hard to convince the, the policy advisors that we couldn't do it. And uh, what did it bring you to say no? Because that was one of your questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what will it bring us as economists when we do this? Well, you, you clearly state where, where there is a boundary there. Uh, it saves you a lot of work, actually, and it, it, it saves it, you a lot of it, work. It saves you a lot of arguing uh, of things which you actually, in your heart, you know, you can't do that, right? So, so that's one thing. Uh, climate is the other one. So, indeed, uh, as we said, economists had already solved it. That was the reason why climate, as a program, was abandoned from the CPB, because the economists had nothing to say anymore. Yeah. Well, we have brought the program back. Uh, and I think for good reasons, right? So um, we are trying to, to reignite cooperation with the SCP and PBL. Um, yeah, but I don't want to so leave this on the table. So you said no, and it br did, I mean, we can make fun about it, but it does bring you something. What does it bring you, in other words, Peter, when you say no, and what does it bring you when you say, okay, bring climate back? What did it bring the CPB? Well, clearly, that, that you're back to the questions which are on the table at this very moment. Uh, and that just providing a technical solution, introduce the market mechanism and carbon dioxide markets, okay, that's it. But how to implement that? And th there's a much more complex story to tell. But maybe the, the answer is easy. Maybe it is sometimes saying no is the best thing for the world and sometimes going on is the best thing. I think it's, it's exactly that, Esther. It's, it's integrity about the problems that it's your role to tackle. Okay. So it's integrity. And what do you need to get to that type of integrity? Do we need another seminar? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No. We, we need to have a conversation and uh, you need okay. to be challenged. So I think we need to challenge ourselves uh, okay. once in a while, but we also need to organize challenge. Okay. Uh, and that means engaging with people from different perspectives. And sometimes put others than economists in the room, for example. Mm. Senna, your takeaway? Or Marcel, you wanted no. to add something? No? Uh, uh, great things were said. I think three things. Number one, always start with the real world. Number two, um, with influence, with power comes a lot of responsibility. How, however small you think your role is, is the second one. And the third one, we should stop bullshitting. We don't know, we don't know. <laughs> okay. We can decide to stop bullshitting. I don't know if anybody's doing something really different <laughs> tomorrow, but we, we can uh, decide to do it. Paul? I was struck by what you said, you, you introduced the word integrity. And on top of that, I think it's also a question about responsibility. So we should perhaps also have a debate about what's our responsibility as economists, as CPB, and so on, as economic policy advisors. Because I think we do have a responsibility. We are not just analytical academic bystanders. We have a, a role to play. Okay. Well, go and play it then, I would say. And thank <laughs> you all so much for being here. Thank you to the audience. Thank you so much, Marcel Timmer, for organizing Senna for being so open. I think when politicians are in their first years, you can still talk to them. For Paul de Bell and definitely for Diane Coyle. Thank you so Thank much. You There's a drink you. here. Thank you at home for listening, watching and being with us. I hope you've learned a lot as well. We will have a drink here. Grab one at home. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.